thank you for joining us for another in our series of online programs. My name is Patrice Weaver with the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. The Commission is a secular, nonpartisan state agency that strives to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and promote public understanding of the history. Now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to our education coordinator, Sandra Crane, as she explains how the Nazi policy of Aryanization of Jewish property and businesses played out in the large department stores in Germany in a program that we call The Great Steal. Sandra? Thank you, Patrice. And thanks again for all the extensive research you've done and identifying historical photos and images for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Okay, so we don't typically associate Germany with fashion. The German fashion industry was mass producing designs from Paris. But by the 1900s, the total number of German department stores and sales volume surpassed those in all nations except in the United States. And so as you see in the middle of the photo, middle of the uh, screen here, you're looking at Ermann Gerson, who in 1848 founded the first department store. And we can get a glimpse of how elegant and stately the store was. He produced coats and capes and cloaks for the Prussian royal family, Prussian royal family. So he was a very prestigious company. And you can see in the right hand corner, he included in every one of his coats, his label to continue his recognition. After his death, his heirs continued the business. And by 1894, the Herman, the Herman Gerson company was the largest in the industry. Now we're gonna take a look at Berlin in the 1920s. After World War I, during the Weimar Republic, Berlin became a thriving, sophisticated, vibrant, and sometimes people would say decadent, center of breaking ground abstraction expressionist art, jazz, dance, film, theater, ballet, manufacturing, and even fashion. As you can see in the photos, I think it was an atmosphere of bon vivant living. Under the Weimar government, the censorship was outlawed by the constitution. It was an anything goes atmosphere, but it was not uh, endorsed by everyone as we will soon find out. Things changed drastically. In 1933, the Nazis assumed power and in less than three months, a new censorship policy was implemented. And as you see on these screens, these familiar images of boycotts that this economic boycott targeted Jewish owned businesses and offices of Jewish professionals. The boycott was aimed to intimidate Jews and discourage Germans from shopping at Jewish stores. The goal obviously was to socially and economically isolate Jews. Let's keep in mind now we're looking at the population of Germany in 1933. The German population was 505,000 out of 65, over 65,000 Germans, which is really less than 1% of the total population. Nevertheless, the Nazi propaganda believed in the existence of Jews with fabulous riches. The fact is that Jewish ownership of private real capital closely matched the population at probably 1.6%. So while German Jews in the 1930s were maybe better educated than the average German, they were certainly not massively more prosperous. In a few minutes, we're gonna take a look at this um, clip that Patrice found from British Movie Tone. And we're going to see in this chilling clip how, 
how the boycotting of Jews began and how, and we're going to see the um, storming of the, of the military presence and we're going to see Nazi youth in uniforms and how huge crowds really participated in this boycott. So we'll take a minute or so and look at this newsreel. So with these images, we can see how the Nazis exploited the Jewish population economically through the program of expropriation, which by definition means that the state seizes property from, the, from its owners and public use or benefit against the wishes of the owner. And here we have another example of another stage. This first stage was called voluntary Aryanization from 1933 until the summer of 1938. In early 1933, there were about 100,000 Jewish owned businesses. A half of them were retail, small retail stores dealing in clothing. And as you see in the photo here, mom and pop neighborhood stores and the rest were factories, workshops, and professional offices. And fortunately, this, this couple that you see at this store was able to leave Berlin, and they did escape to Belgium and France, and, and did, they were able to flee and escape Nazi terror. The Nazis state encouraged Jewish businesses that were already facing deep economic and social discrimination due to the boycotts to sell their businesses at radically reduced prices. Jewish owners who were so desperate to immigrate or dispose of a failing business accepted a selling price that was only 20 to 30 percent of the actual value. In this next slide, we see here, we have a photograph of the store called Gummy Vial, which was a well-known Jewish-owned store, store that made galoshes and rubber goods. But when the store was Aryanized by Stam and Bosserman, it was taken over, they retained the name Gumi. And the reason that they did was because it had great name recognition and this Jewish-owned company had a very solid uh, reputation. But it's an example of Aryanization. The next slide here is the decree on exclusion of Jews from economic life. So again, it becomes stricter. The sec this is a second phase, which is called forced Aryanization. And it went into effect from Kristallnacht 1938 until the collapse of the Nazi regime. Again, economically, it was a very significant blow to Jews. Her Hermann Goring, in addition to being the commander and the chief of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, he was also the director of the four-year plan to rebuild the German economy. And one of the ways, of course, that he and his cronies came up with was to help pump money into the economy. How? By seizing 
uh, Jewish goods and seizing all, all properties and, and excluding Jews from economic life. Let's take a look at some of the wording on the decree on exclusion of Jews from economic life in 1938. Here you can see from, the, from this photo, they, the decree stripped Jews from all paths of economic livelihood. So Jews were forbidden to own retail shops, mail order houses, and even forbidden handmade goods in their home. Many Jews did tailoring, piecemeal, and again, this was forbidden. So it, the Jewish businesses were confiscated by the state, closed or transferred to non-Jewish ownership. This combination of terror, propaganda, and boycott and legislation was so effective that two-thirds of Jewish-owned businesses closed or were sold to non-Jews for very reduced prices. Another severe restriction was imposed, and this was the limiting of money held. In addition, Jews were forbidden from holding a certain amount of Reichmarks in their bank accounts. So for example, if a store was sold forcibly at one-tenth of the, of the real value, let's say 10,000 Reichmarks, but the Nazis noticed that the Jewish family already had the, uh, the limit of 5,000 Reichmarks. So the government keeps all the money and the owner gets nothing. The Nazis assigned every remaining Jewish-owned businesses, business to non-Jewish trustees to oversee its immediate for sale to non-Jews. And of course, the trustee fees were also paid by the Jewish owners. And as what we mentioned just a few minutes ago, some of these profits went straight into the office of Hermann Goring to build up the military and was part of the four-year plan. And again, this, this, this money was used from the confiscation of property and valuables from the Jewish population. There are no precise figures available for the total value of property seized, but we can imagine the heavy burden that it placed on Jews. Here we're talking about businesses. So let's shift for a moment to see how American corporations viewed the Jewish crisis overseas. American industrialists and Wall Street bankers had extensive business ties with Germany. A familiar story played out in Hollywood, which was one of the largest movie markets for American produced films. Bank executives were deeply involved in managing German investments and were holding millions of dollars in German bonds. As we can see here, Standard Oil, General Motors, Ford, IBM, and even our own Coca-Cola all had factories in Germany during Hitler years. We can see, <coughs> excuse me, we can see the complicity here of, of the, um, the American companies involved with the Nazis. General Motors and Ford were the largest producers of trucks for the German army and accounted for half of Germans' production of tanks and motors. The audio auto executives by then were thoroughly aware of what was happening to German Jews, but profits were clearly more important than principles. In 1998, I think this is an interesting point, a Washington Post reporter uncovered a letter written by the chairman of GM to a shareholder saying, German internal affairs should not be the business of GM management. The underlining message is, of course, profits over principle. This is partially what explains America's mute response to the Holocaust. It's also interesting to note that after the war, Ford Motor Company, I'm going to use a, a Yiddish term here, had the chutzpah to be paid compensation from American government for the bomb damage sustained at their plants in Cologne, Germany.
And now let's get back to the topic of department stores. We're going to be looking at a very, very famous case, the Wertheim department store. As we see here, this was um, Georg Wertheim, and he was the founder of the largest department stores in pre-Hitler Germany. He was founded by Georg and his brothers, and they operated various stores in Berlin and Rostock and a few other cities. It was very well known and very, very well managed. The flagship Wertheim store was located on Leipzig Plaza and it opened in 1896. And it was designed by famous architects and it was called the crown jewel of the main shopping street. This was an elegant structure and attracting an upscale uh, clientele. It was a place to promenade and a place to be seen. And we can see here in the photo, the portico, in the portico, the classical sculptures and the figures from the Old Testament. So we can imagine how sophisticated and ornate and regal looking this uh, department store was. Uh, it was the largest department store in Europe at the time with approximately 1.4 million square feet of floor space. Imagine how many blocks that took up. Uh, in this complex, I've read that the real estate was the size of 13 football fields. As we saw in the earlier clip, in 1933, the department stores became the focus of the Nazi boycotts. The Wertheim department stores didn't get a reprieve from the Nazi Aryanization policy. Jewish employees were forced from their positions by the government mandates. The Wertheim family attempted to avoid losing the control of the company by making George Jorge's wife, Ursula, the principal shareholder, since she was considered Aryan under German law, under the Nazi law. But in the end, their efforts were unsuccessful, even though they divorced to keep the shares in Aryan hands. And again, we can see very, very large signs boycotting, boycotting um, shopping for Jews. These are two familiar images that we have seen throughout the last, in the last five years there. Okay. And here we see the young girl, her name is Barbara Princip, and she was with her mother and brother at a Berlin zoo. This is a picture, 1938. We can assume that they had a very privileged wife. She was the daughter of uh, the uh, Gunther, one of the, the brothers who founded the Wertheim department store. But these department store magnets fled Germany and they arrived in the United States totally penniless in the 1940s. And Gunter, her father, ran a chicken farm in Southern New Jersey. It's quite a come down. Okay. Now, the Wertheim department store did not survive. As we can see here, the Leipzig Plaza in March 1943 was damaged by Allies exploding bombs, and it was finally ultimately destroyed by fire. After the war, the company that acquired the Wertheim companies rebuilt, and they went on to become one of the most successful German retailers in Germany. But it changed hands again and it was acquired by uh, the Karstadt, which is a department store chain in 1993. But this is not the end of the story. Here we see the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989. It was a pivotal event in world history. It represented the fall of the Iron Curtain and the fall of communism in Eastern and Central Europe. And we can see here people trying to reunite. The fall of the wall affected live the lives of civilians in East and West Germany. But 
It also affected the fate of the Wertheim family after the reun reunification of Germany. Here we have the Claims Conference logo. The con this is a long name. The Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany is located in New York, and it functioned as the organization that filed claims against the German government for the Wertheim and other Jewish-owned properties. Now, the Wertheim case, this department store, was one of the biggest and most bitterly disputed claims for restitution of the property. The statute of limitation for claims in West Germany ran out in the 1960s, but when East Germany fell in 1989, the newly reunited government passed a law allowing claims for former Jewish property that had been nationalized by East Germany. This opened up doors and opportunities for reclaiming Jewish property. Here again, we see the daughter, Barbara, who's looking at the site of the former department store. So in 2001, an initial ruling was in favor of the claims conference, but the German government and Karstadt, the large department store chain, appealed the decision. So we see here that it, the case ran on and on. And in 2003, after a number of approaches by the claims conference, the German government finally dropped its appeals. But the car start department store chain never uh, did not give up and they refused to settle. The legal battle, battle continued and Barbara never gave up. She made many trips to Berlin between 2001 and 2005 to personally tell her story to the German media. This is my family. This is my, the site of my department store. Right before the favorable decision, she returned to Berlin with her two grandsons to send a message that the next generation was ready to fight on after she was gone. Barbara passed away this uh, uh, last March. But in October 2005, the German high court rejected the Karstadt appeal. So on December 1, 2005, Karstadt announced its intention to withdraw its claims to most of the Wertheim properties. And in 2005, the German administrative court awarded $17 million from the sale of a piece of property that once was part of the Wertheim emperor to Barbara, a daughter of Gunther, and her nephew, Martin Wertheim, who lived in New Jersey. So she did get to see um, some restitution. In 2006, as recorded on financial statements, the claims conference received revenues regarding Wertheim claims totally, totaling approximately $25 million. And the legal battle still continued the executive vice president of the claims conference at that time said, this case is as much about morality as it is about legality. And here in March two, uh, 2007, the claims conference finally reached a settlement with the Karstadt company, primarily regarding a piece of land called the Lenny Triangle on the valuable piece of property that was marked the spot of the Wertheim department store from 1896. The land was developed to include retail and office space, 270 shops, flats, Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and as you can see, it was renamed the Mall of Berlin. And you can notice the, the gorgeous architecture, the glass covered arcades, the arch skylights reflecting panels, all touches of expensive elegance. Under this settlement, Karstag paid the claim conference 88 million euros. The historic value of the property is, is incalculable, but arrangements for payments to the heirs were put in place for the living Wertheim heirs, both in Germany and in the United States. At the opening of the Mall of Berlin, 
the Berlin mayor told 10,000 people who were there for the opening, it's really great that after the war and 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we finally managed to close the gap where the great Wertheim store once stood. The mall stands just east of where the Berlin Wall divided the city during the Cold War and a few dozen meters south of where Hitler had his bunker. He added, the Leipzigplatz Square has a historic importance in Berlin. Wertheim stood for quality, innovation, and we're looking forward to continuing that tradition. Here we see Stuart Eisenstadt, a native Atlantan and a man of honor and a man of many titles. He was, as you know, he was recently appointed by Secretary of State Blinken, a special advisor on Holocaust issues. But when he served as Deputy Secretary of the Treasury and Special Representative of the President and Secretary of State for Holocaust Issues, in 2000, he testified before the Senate Relations Committee. I think that his explanation is a perfect summary for this presentation. And I'm going to read what he said. The Holocaust was not only the worst genocide in history, but also history's greatest theft. Jewish businesses were Aryanized, that is, seized from their owners and turned over for others with the complicity of German banks. Jews were forced to sell their homes for little or no compensation. Their personal property was stripped from them before they were sent off to the camps. Their communal property, synagogues, schools, cultural centers were confiscated and most of it was destroyed. Through extensive negotiations with the German government, Eisenstadt was responsible for creating a comprehensive foundation. The German government and German uh, companies contributed $5 billion under, under the current exchange rates. And in 1952, and I think it was called the Luxembourg uh, Pact, West Germany agreed to pay 3 billion Deutschmarks, which is approximately $715 billion to the state of Israel. The money was for the cost of resettling so great a number of uprooted and destitute Jewish refugees after the war. Germany then reenact, enacted legislation mandating direct compensation to World War II for injuries committed by German companies, including slave labor, forced labor, insurance, banking, Aryanized property, and even medical experiments. The German government continues to make payments to the dwindling number of Holocaust survivors as they enter their final years. The chairman of the Conference on Jewish Materials Against Germany, he was Julius Berman said, and I'm gonna quote, while a person came out of the camps very young and eventually developed a life of their own over the years, the impact of what happened at the beginning is coming to fore. Whether it's mental or physically, they're sicker than peers of their own age. So I think that really does explain why the, the need to compensate Holocaust survivors to take care of them. Um, in conclusion, Eisenstadt, Eisenstadt said, I'm hopeful that all victims, whether or not they will directly benefit, will take real satisfaction in the knowledge that deserving Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazism will get recognition for their suffering and at least some measure of justice. Um, and again, we do have a monthly newsletter and it, in that you can look for um, articles, request a speaker, a program for your organization, find links to other programs on our YouTube channel. And, this, and we have our website here.